you as if it's a real show. Hey everyone, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. If you're wondering why I'm wearing a hat, it's because I wish all of you a very happy, safe, Independence Day, 4th of July, and today's show is in honor of 4th of July. You see, I was Googling how to make one of those really fabulous watermelon cakes because I wanted to make one as a healthy dessert for the 4th of July. And I found this wonderful YouTube channel with someone named Jaden Lohm who was making a watermelon cake. And I asked her if she would come on the show and make it, having no idea that she is 100% plant-based. So here she is. Please welcome Jaden to the show. It's so nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. Well, I, I mean, what are the chances that I'm Googling how to make a watermelon cake? And there's, there's a few videos. It's not just one. And I picked the vegan. How do you like that? That's really cool. Yeah. So may I ask how old you are? I'm 14 years old. And have you always been vegan? No, I started being vegan in 2016. So I was nine years old. Um, may I ask why? Like, did you possibly see one of the movies or did you read a book or how did that transpire? Um, my dad is a cardiologist and he actually watched Forks Over Knives and he really wanted our whole family to be vegan. So he like transferred us. That's amazing. So now, you know, you probably are old enough to remember, did, did, did he have a conversation with you and say, hey, we want to eat this way because it's healthy? What did he, how, what did he say? And are there other kids in the family? Yeah. So I have five siblings. They're all younger than me. And um, uh, basically started my dad and my mom. They were both um, vegan at the time and all of us weren't vegan yet and so eventually we all kind of like switched over to being vegan like slowly he showed us some videos about it and everything but yeah we all kind of like realized that it was better for like animals and everything. Wow uh, what did I ask what are the ages of your five younger brothers or sisters? Um, I have a younger brother he's 13 I have another younger brother that is eight a younger sister that is 10 another younger sister that is five and another younger sister that is three years old. Wow. Well, but the three-year-old probably didn't really even remember having to switch because she was probably almost born that way, right? Yeah. So my five-year-old sister, we started being vegan right after she was born. So the two youngest ones probably don't know any different. No. All right. So they probably don't mind. What, what was it like for the four of you that had already been exposed a little bit to the other way of eating? Um, it was kind of hard because like every time we got invited to a lot of different things and a lot of times there wasn't any vegan options there. Like birthday parties that always have pizza and cake and a bunch of sodas and everything and we couldn't eat that. But eventually like our friends, they weren't really nice. They got us special stuff and it was it was good. Oh, that's fantastic. Do you enjoy being vegan? Yeah, I think it's really good for the environment and for like our health and for animals and everything. That's amazing. And you're only 14. That's, that's, that's sooner. I, you became vegan at nine. I was 17. So thank you so much for, uh, for what you're doing for the planet, the animals and, and for your own health too. Not that you were maybe unhealthy when you were nine <laughs> the other way. Um, what kind of things do you enjoy eating vegan that maybe you didn't eat before you became vegan? Um, I like having a lot of tofu because I think it, you can make it so many different ways and it's just really awesome. And yeah, a lot of other beans and yeah, a lot of that kind of stuff. Do you cook yourself ever? Yeah, sometimes. I make food for my family sometimes, just like simple stuff like spaghetti or pizza that we make ourselves. That's really cool. So the four older siblings that had already been exposed to like a standard American diet, mm -hmm. was it equally difficult or easy for all of you or was one of you might be more of a little bit of a holdout of the group? Um, I think my two, the two younger ones of the four, they were like really, they were like four and three years old. So they kind of just went with it because that's what everyone else was doing. But I think my younger brother, he liked having like meat, I guess, more than the rest of us. But he eventually like got over it. He switched with us. So. Well, I would imagine if your dad's a cardiologist, I'd love to meet him, by the way, sometime. I'm sure he had reasons to want to do this. It had to do with health. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, at that young age of nine, were you able to understand the, the connection between eating animals and health? Um, a little bit, because I kind of had, he'd been a cardiologist for kind of a long time, and he explained how that helps with your heart and your arteries and everything. So I kind of got it, but I understand it more now. That's really cool. Do you have friends that are vegan now? 
Um, I have a few friends that are vegetarian, but they're not vegan. I think I have one friend, she wants to be vegan, but her dad is kind of um, a bit like reluctant, I guess, because she doesn't really eat that much food. Oh boy, well, maybe you can introduce her dad to your dad and say, well, he's a yeah. doctor, so he should know better. So you are, are fairly young for having a YouTube channel. When did you start it? Why did you start it? What's it called if we want to watch it? Um, I started like in September or October last year, I think it's called Jaden's Vegan Culinary Creations. And I think I started it because I wanted to do a YouTube channel about something that I liked. And also my dad has a YouTube channel and I liked how like he inspired and influenced a bunch of people into like becoming vegan and I wanted to do the same thing. That is so cool. Have you ever heard of Genesis Butler? Um, I don't think so. Well, she's a young person. I mean, she, and she, you know, she, I just, I just love when young people are doing this because it, I think it makes a difference because I think you can influence younger people as well. Whereas I don't think like, you know, many 14 year olds are going to watch my channel, mm -hmm. but a lot of adults are going to be watching you make this. So, so how did you learn how to make a watermelon cake? Is it pretty easy? Yeah, it's pretty easy, but, um, my younger daughter, she was turning two or not daughter. My <laughs> She was turning two and we were at uh, my friend's house, my parents' friend's house, and um, they made her a watermelon cake and I thought it was super cool. It looked really good and everyone like ate it super fast. It was really, really, really good. So I wanted to try it for a video. Wow, that's great. Well, tell us how to make it because I think it'd be the perfect okay. treat to beat the summer heat and especially for a 4th of July celebration or a birthday. Yeah. So all you really need is just like a watermelon and some like other fruit if you want to decorate it. So you basically cut the ends off and then you shave off all the rind. And I did that ahead of time because it kind of takes a long time. So it just looks like this and you can make it multiple tiers and you can use different sized watermelons. You can make it like a square or a rectangle or whatever shapes that you want. And then you can just decorate it with fruit. Like I have cookie cutters and toothpicks so I can like make different shapes and stick everything on. So I'm just gonna cut out some. And it's actually like, you can do it many different ways. And a lot of the times the fruit just sticks by itself because it's like liquid and you can just decorate it however you want. It's like super easy and you can add accessories or yeah, it's like super fun and it's really easy and everyone loves it pretty much. Do you need some toothpicks to get some of the fruit to stick? Yeah, sometimes you use toothpicks, but a lot of the times it just can stick by itself. I don't know. Um, for like the blueberries, like if you want to make a design with it, I use toothpicks for that because it's easier to keep it there. But also I think you should like keep the toothpicks out a little bit so that people don't just eat them when they're eating the cake. Yeah, I'm wondering like, how do you even eat the cake? How do you how do you decide to cut into it? Like, does, does somebody actually cut a slice for you? Yeah, it's like a slice. You can cut it like a regular cake if you wanted to. And do you, use, oh. do you use a seedless watermelon? Um, sometimes, but a lot of the times I just use a regular watermelon because it's more natural, I guess. Yeah, I, I see. You know, have you ever seen those creations from that store, uh, edible arrangements where like, they mm -hmm. look like flowers? So do you make some of the shapes look like flowers? Yeah, I do that sometimes in different shapes. Yeah. yeah. What are the fruits that you have on the plate there? Um, I have raspberries, blueberries, and thinly sliced pears for like red, white, and blue to make a 4th of July thing. That is so cool. Sometimes I've seen people like put what seems to be like frosting on their watermelon cake. Mm -hmm. I tried that once. I used like aquafaba. I whipped it up and made it like stiff and everything, but it kind of like melted a little bit. So I didn't do it again. Yeah. Well, this definitely has to be the healthiest cake ever. How long does it take normally to make one of the cakes? Um, Maybe like 30 minutes at the most, if you're like stacking it and making it super nice and fancy. That's nice. Yeah, that'd be a fun project for the family to do. Yeah. And I bet a lot of people have all the ingredients already in their refrigerator for 4th of July. It's really just a matter of assembling it. Mm -hmm. Have you done any other creations with watermelons or fruit? Um, I've made like a Christmas tree kind of thing for Christmas. It was like, I used a banana and I just stuck fruit all over it and it looked like a Christmas tree kind of. That's cool. I love food as art. I think you have one that you already made. Yeah. You want to show it? Yeah. <laughs> wow, that is beautiful. So it, maybe it was two watermelons? Yeah, it was one big one and then one smaller one. 
That is so cool. That, that, I just love this idea so much and I'm definitely going to do it. Man, I love it. I'm trying to think, have you ever seen those, they're not like toothpicks, but they're longer. They're like skewers. Mm -hmm. That could be kind of cool sticking out yeah. of it, you know? I love it. I love it. So what are your favorite things to eat vegan? And do you, do you eat different things every day for breakfast, lunch, and dinner? Or do you kind of have a routine like a lot of us grownups where we kind of eat the same thing every day? Um, I kind of have a routine. Sometimes I have like just regular cereal, but like the like granola type of cereal, or I have um, oatmeal for breakfast. And then for lunch, I mostly have some sort of pasta or spaghetti dish because it's super easy and all of my little siblings like it. And then for dinner, we usually just wing it. I don't know, sometimes we get like restaurants or other things, but it's usually pretty like diverse for dinner. Wow, do you have a favorite? Um, I like when my dad makes this like chili. I think I made a video about it. Um, it's like really good. It tastes really good. It has like lentils and a bunch of different vegetables and everything. Do you, do you have an instant pot in your family? Yeah. Do you know how to use it? Uh, kind of. That's, that's cool. That's cool. Do you eat vegetables or are you a kid that doesn't like vegetables? Uh, I like most vegetables except for mushrooms. <laughs> You know, I don't like mushrooms either. And technically they're not a vegetable. They're a fungus. Yeah. I think it's weird that we eat them. And I know a lot of doctors say they're healthy. I'll eat them if they're cut really small and cooked, but I really don't enjoy them. <laughs> yeah, me either. Yeah, that's so cool. What's your favorite fruit? Um, Probably honeydew or watermelon. Yeah, I bet you could do something like this with some of the other melons. I mean, it would be smaller, yeah. but I don't see why you couldn't. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that would be really cool. Yeah. Have you seen any of the plant-based documentaries? Um, I think I think I've seen like parts of some of them, but I haven't seen one like all together yet. Okay. So what do you do for fun when you're not making YouTube videos? Um, I like to do cross country and track and yeah, I like to just more um, cook more things. Wow, that's that's fantastic. You think you want to be a doctor like your father someday? Uh, maybe. Probably. That's so cool. Well, I'd love to meet him sometime and, and, and have him on the show because I didn't realize, like I said, I was looking for watermelon cakes. I had no idea of, about you until I, I watched your channel. Yeah, he's like right here. Do you want to meet him? Yeah, I'd love to. We love meeting family members. Hi, Chef AJ. How are you? Hi, Dr. Loma. I, I'm sorry that I did not know who you are, but I'm so happy to <laughs> meet you now. Yeah, no, I, I've been a, a fan of yours for a long time. And uh, so I'm proud of Jaden with all of her activism. The channel was all her, all the video editing and the shooting. Uh, I was very impressed because I've done videos myself and it took me forever to learn it. And it was so hard. And she just kind of all of a sudden whipped up a video and I go, wow, that's amazing. How'd you do that? <laughs> that's incredible. Maybe she can help you with your channel. I didn't realize yeah. you did all the editing yourself because I, I don't even do that. That's so hard. I, it's just, that's right. If you want, to, if you have something technologically to do, give it to a younger person. That's for sure. Yes, exactly right. <laughs> yeah. So you're a cardiologist. Um, when did you go plant-based yourself? So yeah, it was about 2016. It was just a random Netflix suggestion that, hey, you should watch Fork Sugar Knives. And I said, watch Fork Sugar Knives and kind of watched it. And honestly, it made me angry <laughs> because uh, throughout my medical training, all medical school, residency, fellowship, there was not a single mention of lifestyle medicine, plant-based diets, heart disease reversal. Our focus for prevention was all, here's a bunch of medicines for blood pressure and cholesterol, take your aspirin. I mean, that's what prevention was. That's the way we were trained when really prevention should be eat healthy, exercise, lose weight, don't smoke, all those types of things. And, you know, it was one of those things where I grew up eating very unhealthy. I was almost hundred pounds heavier. My sister was 400 pounds in high school, parents are 300 pounds, and we just followed our culture. And I just wish our medical training opened my eyes to, hey, you know, this is not really the right thing to do in regards to your health, but it, it really didn't. So forks over knives made me angry. And then initially I was like, I can't believe it. This can't be true. I have to look at this all myself and see, is the science real? Is this legitimate? Because there's a lot of, you know, misinformation out there, but it's all legitimate. And so, uh, I said, we got to do this. And we transitioned. It took a, you know, took a little while, but we, we got there. And we're, it's one of the best decisions we've ever made. And my wife 
who's always had a preventative mindset. She's a family medicine physician, a superstar with the kids and, and with everything, uh, supported us so much too. So, well, that's amazing. And we appreciate it. So are you telling me you used to weigh a hundred pounds more than you do now? I was about 260 pounds. I lost at most, I think it was somewhere around 90 pounds. I've gained maybe 10 or 15 of that back a little bit, but, uh, you know, uh, it, it, it was uh, huge because trying to keep up with the kids, they have a lot of energy. It was hard when you when you're you know overweight like that, and so. Um, Do you yeah. remember your father being overweight, Jaden? Um, not really. No. When we look at the pictures, we look at those pictures, and we go, "Wow, I can't believe that." <laughs> it's funny that is that you know. I remember, Dr. Kim Williams once said, and maybe he said it more than once, that there's only two kinds of cardiologists: vegan and those who haven't read the data. So that's a very inspiring quote, no question. And I think it's a very true quote. After we went plant-based in 2016, it only took me one year before I said, I need to work with Dr. Williams. So I actually moved my practice to Rush and I was working with Dr. Williams at Rush for a couple of years, trying to get lifestyle medicine, plant-based nutrition initiatives going. But unfortunately money talks in our current healthcare system and none of them are gonna be profitable programs. And so nothing really flew very well. And that's what got me out here to Monterey, California. And so you were you were living in, in the Midwest before? Yeah, we grew up in the Chicago suburbs myself. We were in Naperville, Illinois for a long time. Me too. I'm, that's where I grew up. All right. <laughs> but California is so much better, isn't it? It's so nice. Yeah. <laughs> yep. That's what I say. That is fantastic. Well, that is so cool. I love your story because so many people say, oh, my kids won't eat healthy. But yours seem to. Yeah, well, what I always tell people is, guess what? It's not your kid's decision what they should be eating. It's your decision as a parent to be responsible and make sure that they're eating the foods that are good for them, that's gonna nourish them and help them grow and develop the right way, not cause diseases years down the road. You know, if you let a kid do whatever they wanted, they'd be playing video games all day. They would, you know, they'd never do their homework. They wouldn't go to school. So that should, you know, extend to the food too. You need to make sure that you get them eating the right food to keep them healthy and strong and, and stop them from, you know, developing bad habits, which is gonna literally could kill them decades later if they develop heart disease, diabetes, or, or other problems. Well, absolutely. And not even decades later, I've heard Dr. Esselstyn say that when a children die, say in car accidents and they do autopsies, they find cardiovascular disease in children as young as 10 years old. Actually, it's even younger than that. I saw um, one study where uh, three-year-olds had fatty streaks in their coronary arteries and then I took it even further. I saw another one where they showed um, in a pregnant lady who had a genetic high cholesterol, really, really high cholesterol, the fetus in the mother's womb, they could identify cholesterol fatty streaks in the baby's coronary arteries in the mother's womb even. So certainly the sooner you get healthy, you know, with your cholesterol numbers down, eating the right way, the better you're gonna be decades and decades and decades later. I tell my patients that all the time. I mean, I, I'm, I'm guessing your patients are adults, but I've heard of young children being put on statins. Isn't that a little bit insane? Yeah, I mean, when you really think about it, you know, we, we focus on trying to get the LDL cholesterol down uh, less than 70, you're golden, you're in great shape if you can get your LDL that low. The average American's LDL cholesterol is 125, but when you look at the average vegan who's eating a healthier type vegan diet, it's under 70, right? And so what's the need for statin therapy? Honestly, if everybody ate the right way, you know, more than 90% of people, there's always exceptions, but a vast majority of people, if they really ate the right way, stayed active, stayed thin, they, they wouldn't even need the statin. So the idea of putting a kid on a statin is a little bit, wow, it doesn't really come down to that, that we can't change our diets to the point where we just need to give our kids some medications and just let them eat their chicken nuggets and their French fries and ah, doesn't make sense. That, that just, it's crazy to me. Have you been able to influence anyone other than your immediate family, like maybe any other colleagues or other family members that aren't living in your household? Yeah. Yeah, 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 quite a few. Actually, one of my good friends from training, Dr. David Thompson's a cardiologist, him uh, and his wife and all of his kids, they went plant-based uh, at Rush. Uh, a couple of the other uh, cardiologists went plant-based as well. And then um, there's been, you know, I've actually done a lot of activism, uh, started a nonprofit back in Chicago, pbnm.org. We did lots of lectures, community talks, going to churches and, and other places. And I, I still to this day, even though it's been a couple of years, you know, the pandemic obviously slowed a lot of that stuff down, 
I still get emails and messages to this day that, that you know, that presentation that we gave or whatever really influenced them and, and changed them. And it's so, so great to hear. I even had one time, I was just calling somebody about a positive calcium score, their coronary arteries. And I was telling, oh, you know, you have some plaque, you need to eat healthy, you should wash forks over knives. And I randomly ran into him two months later and he goes, you're the guy who told me to watch Forks Over Knives, right? I'm like, probably, yeah, that's probably me. He was the chair of the board of a hospital locally and he got all the board members of the hospital to watch Forks Over Knives and he made the medical staff watch it. They changed their hospital menu. So many positive changes can happen when people hear the truth. And it, so it, I, it's, I feel once I... I discovered the truth and, and, you know, shared it with such an awesome family, uh, spreading it. I feel obligated that, you know, to spread the message, just like, just like you do such a great job spreading it. So that's incredible. Hey, Jaden, are you going to decorate the second cake? Cause if you are, if you want to do it while I'm talking, oh, yeah. go for it. Go know, for it. Yeah. Love, I mean, I just feel bad having you sit there and Jaden, if you have any questions or want to add to the conversation, please feel free to say anything to us. So, you know, you talk about the truth, Dr. Lohm, but there's doctors that don't believe that this is the truth. They believe that oil is good, even for people with cardiovascular yeah. disease. It, and it's, it's confusing. I, I honestly, the, the data is very confusing and more than, more than just oil, chicken, how, plant-based you have to be? Can you tolerate small amounts of processed foods in your diet? The, you know, nutritional science is, is confusing. There's a lot of influence by industry that's in there. It's not easy to do what we call randomized controlled trials. Like for a pill, a medication, you get a placebo, you get the medicine, you randomize patients, it's blinded, you don't know who's getting what, and you wait five or 10 years to figure out who dies and who doesn't. And that's how you know if the medicine works. And of course, all the funding is going to come from a drug company that makes billions of dollars. Well, the broccoli industry is not going to fund these types of research for food and, you know, and, and really uh, dietary effects happen, you know, start in childhood. So doing that type of research is, is a challenge when it comes to nutrition. And then not only that, but doctors don't read the nutritional research. They are trained in it in their medical training. And most doctors themselves don't honestly eat a healthy diet. Uh, Kim Williams always says the number one cause of death in cardiologists is heart disease. It, it really shouldn't be, but it is. And so, you know, things like the olive oil, when you compare sources of fat, if you take away beef fat or animal fat and you substitute olive oil, guess what happens? People have fewer heart attacks and they have fewer strokes. So then people say, oh, olive oil must be good for you, right? Well, no, it's just less harmful than the animal fat. I kind of like compare that one to saying, hey, if you gave a bunch of people cyanide and a bunch of people arsenic, you're going to realize the people who get the arsenic, they don't die so fast, but the people who get the cyanide, man, they're really keeling over. So you know what? Arsenic must be good for you, right? Because people don't die as fast. Well, no, arsenic's not good for you. It's just less harmful than the cyanide. That's so, so funny because I have a mentor, Dr. Ellen Goldhammer, True North, and he's always said, just because something is less bad doesn't mean it's good. That's right. That's exactly the truth. That's the research when it comes to olive oil, comparing it to beef fat. Same thing with chicken. Everybody thinks chicken's so healthy for them. Well, yeah, if you compare it to red meat, chicken's a slight step in the right direction, but just a slight one. But if you're eating chicken to get protein, well, why not get protein from beans and lentils where you get no cholesterol, no saturated fat, high fiber, you know, everybody always says beans, beans, good for your heart. Nobody says chicken, chicken, good for your heart, right? So, yeah. you know, I, I, my grandfather graduated medical school in the early 1920s. I have a picture of him on the wall with his graduating class. And I don't think cardiology was even a specialty then. Yeah, you're right. It, it wasn't. There's um, even in my practice, there's a cardiologist who kind of grandfathered in and he just kind of became the cardiology specialist, even though he didn't do formal training. Brilliant, brilliant doctor who's just as good as any cardiologist, but it wasn't even, uh, it wasn't even a, um, an actual specialty. And the mindset about heart disease back then was honestly that heart disease is a genetic condition that's progressive in a normal part of aging. And that's kind of the mindset I had going through my training and uh, not at all related to diet and other lifestyle factors, right? And, and unfortunately, you know, the science has evolved and we've, we've figured it out where we know that it is predominantly diet and lifestyle related, even reversible if you go all in on it. And so once my blinders were taken off and I realized all that, I said, listen, I have to tell all my patients the truth. And yeah, I'll go through their medicines and their tests with them. But most of our discussion has to be about the food they eat and, and their lifestyle choices. Yeah. You know, so many people are worried about cancer and Alzheimer's, which I understand are, you know, horrible diseases, but a lot of people don't worry so much about heart disease yet. Isn't that the number one killer of both men and women in our country and perhaps the world? 
It, well, yes, it definitely is. And it has been the number one cause of death in America for more than 100 consecutive years since 1919. The last time it wasn't was 1918, which was the Spanish flu pandemic. And so, yeah, we make this big deal out of other you know, causes of death. I mean, tragedies that happen, accidents, all these things. But when you think about more than 500,000 Americans die every year from heart disease, which is almost 100% preventable. When you look at the stats, you, you, it, it works out to more people die every year from heart disease than the number of American soldiers that died in all wars in American history combined just one year of heart disease. Why haven't we done more, honestly, to stop heart disease in its tracks when we already have the science to show what we need to do and it ultimately comes down to our culture is very unhealthy with food. The food industry is pocketing trillions of dollars in the healthcare industry. The way the reimbursement pattern is set up is we don't get paid to prevent disease. We get paid when people are sick. And that's just Excellent. the reality. I, I see how quickly you did that, Jane. That's mm -hmm. an, another one that's adorable. Thank you. Yeah, that, that is so, how long, Jane, how long do they last once they're made into a cake? Or it just as, I mean, until you eat it, obviously, but does it, does, does cutting it into these shapes, does it make it like maybe go bad a little bit faster? Uh, I think so, but I think if you keep it in like the fridge, it saves better. Yeah, I imagine because a lot of 4th of July gatherings are outside. So if you're doing it outside, eat it very quickly. You know, is it true, Dr. Lohm, that in many people, maybe even 50% of people, the first sign of heart disease is sudden death? Yeah, depending on what study you look at, it's anywhere as low as 20, 25%, all the way up to close to 40% that the first symptom is sudden death. And so I always tell my patients, you got to be healthy now because you don't know if you're going to be lucky or not. And when I have a patient in front of me that has survived an event, I make sure that they know, hey, listen, you are the lucky one. This is your second chance. Now you got to make sure you're doing the right things. And, and it's amazing how some people take it to heart, literally, and they do the right thing and they change their diet, but other people are just like, nah, it's, you know, it's almost like a rite of passage. I'm 50 years old, I had my coronary, I survived it, yay, now I can keep on taking my pills and, and follow this unhealthy lifestyle. It's like, oh, no, that's not what you I, should be doing. <laughs> I just wish I understood what the resistance was in people, especially when they've had like a coronary event or been diagnosed with diabetes. Like I can understand if you're, you know, Jaden's age, you know, no, nobody's really necessarily thinking about heart disease. But when you're a grown up and you've had a doctor tell this to you, I, I mean, what do you think it is? Food addiction? Like that people are so unwilling to change their diet? I think, you know, probably 70 to 80% of people after a big event, especially if you capture them in the hospital, you educate them right there at that moment, 70 to 80% of people will make some, some good changes. How long they'll last is a good question. But yeah, that, that smaller percentage, 20 to 30% that just make no changes. I think it's food addiction, big time. It's culture. It's just their family is not going to do it. So, so they can't do it. There's always marketing right in their face about all these things every time they go out. Uh, to a, a party or football games on they're you know, they're eating something unhealthy. It's honestly, you know, it's not easy to change. It wasn't easy for us. But once you know, this is what you have to do, you got to make it happen. And one of my biggest disappointments in, in our healthcare system, honestly, is that we as doctors, as physicians haven't done more to make it easy. Whenever I talk to somebody, one of my colleagues about the Ornish diet or the Esselstyn diet, they'll be like, yeah, that's great. I'm sure it works. You can prevent and reverse heart disease, but nobody can do it. And I say, so, but that's not true. They just because nobody can't can do it doesn't mean you shouldn't tell them about it. Exactly. Yeah, you can't hide the truth. And not only that, even if even if there is a, a good percentage of people that that drop out who who want to do it to drop out, well then guess what? We need to make it easier for them. We need to make the food available, the cooking classes available. We need to do the right thing so that it is easy. It's like saying. Oh, somebody's got cancer. We have this chemo that can cure them, but you know what? Eh, I don't think they can handle the chemo. So I'm not even going to tell them about it or something like that. Right. That makes no sense whatsoever. Yeah. You know, and we need to tell them, we need to support them. We should have more resources, but we, we just don't. And a lot of it has to do with our culture. Doctors don't eat healthy and the reimbursement is just not there. We should be eating this every day for dessert. Absolutely. Well, you know, everybody, you know, COVID has been on people's minds for a long time, but isn't heart disease really the true pandemic? Oh, there's no question about it. It's pretty much ubiquitous. So pretty much everybody has coronary disease. I'm sure I do. I mean, I had a horrible, unhealthy diet my whole life, uh, except for, you know, starting five years ago or so. Um, so it, it, it's all over the place. And so our, our public health focus really should shift the other Interesting thing that, that boggles me is they always talk about Medicare going broke, trying to pay these bills for heart disease and all these other chronic diseases that are going on. They're trying to, oh, where should we raise the taxes? How should we 
you know, get the funds. And I'm like, wow, no, 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 no. Let's make everybody healthy so we don't have a bill, right? Doesn't that make more sense instead of just trying to, to pay the bill? But you know what? If we do that, the economy will suffer and hospitals might have to close and doctors and nurses would lose their job. It would be not good for the economy. So let's just find out how we can pay the expensive medical bills. I mean, well, you want to hear something funny? This is my chance to brag because I've been vegan for 44 years. I didn't go vegan quite as young as Jaden, but I had a, about 20 years ago in my 40s, I was hit head on by a driver. So I was getting, I don't remember, CAT scan or MRI, but lots of tests from the neck up because I had an injury. And the doctor said, there's, there's no, there's no plaque. There's nothing. You're, there was like, there was nothing. Like he couldn't believe it. He goes, I don't understand. You don't have any streaks, no signs of any plaque anywhere in you. And I'm like, well, it's because I'm vegan, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's great. That's great. It sounds like Nathan Pritikin, who's one of the founders of Lifestyle Medicine. He had severe angina uh, and knew all the science about, you know, other tribes out in the middle of nowhere who eat plant-based, they never have heart disease. He did it for a long time. And before he died, he, he had some guts. He said, I want my autopsy to be published in the New England Journal of Medicine, no matter what it shows. He really had no idea what his arteries were going to look like. And you can look it up online. You can see the New England Journal publication. His arteries were so clean, the pathologist commented, this is unremarkable for a guy his age. Wow. And he already had been diagnosed with heart disease years earlier. So that just amazing. shows it can be reversed because there's people, even vegan doctors that question whether heart disease can be reversed. Yeah. That I wish he could come back from the dead because I would love to interview him. I'd love to interview <laughs> Dr. Walter Kempner, Dr. Roy Swank. I just a little bit late to the party. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And you know, the doctors who say it can't be reversed, the, the, the question always is, how do you define reversal? You know, plaque regression was shown by, shown by Dean Ornish pretty definitively, uh, published, geez, what, 20, 30 years ago, a uh, long time ago. And honestly, though, I tell my patients the percentage of blockage isn't really the most important thing. It's, it's staying alive and not having a heart attack, not having a stroke. That's what I define as reversal, meaning you had a problem or you had plaque and, and never had another problem again. That's all we care about. So when you say patients don't do, when, when not everybody wants to be vegan or whole food plant-based or give up oil, but are they willing to make some changes? Cause I'm trying to think like smoking, do you see, are people still smoking today? Cause I'm, I'm shocked that anybody does, but are, and, cause isn't that a huge risk factor for heart disease? Oh yeah, it's, it's a huge risk factor. So certainly the, the two big things for developing heart disease is LDL cholesterol being high and endothelial injury, injuring to the lining of the artery and smoking causes a lot of uh, endothelial injury. And so yeah, I mean, well, most people, there are a lot of people still smoking. I forget the numbers. It's still like a pretty high, like 10 or 20% of people. And when they have an event, just like if they get diagnosed with lung cancer or lung disease, a lot of people do stop smoking or, or uh, cut back at least. There's a lot of good resources to help, just like most people, change their diet a little bit. But uh, there, are, there are some patients that it's, I can sit there and talk to them for an hour. I pull up PowerPoints in the office. I go through things. I ask them, what do you eat for breakfast, lunch, and dinner? And they come back and they gain five pounds. And I'm like, oh, I spent all that time with you. I get paid nothing for spending an hour with you. I'm doing this because it's the right thing. We need to do all this. And then they, they don't listen, don't gain weight. There's so many barriers at home, family, their culture, their food addictions. I really, to be successful, I need to go home with them. I need to shop with them. Well, maybe, and, maybe you should, you know, I mean, I know that would be a high level of care that insurance probably wouldn't pay for. But I think that, you know, I always say that I always joke with Dr. Doug Lyle. He's a psychologist. I said, I would pay anything for you to come live with me for a while. Just to <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So is it true that when people go on medication for diabetes, that increases their risk for heart disease? Some of them. So some of the medicines have been associated with increased risk of heart attack and even stroke and such. I think one of the things, there's a really a false sense that everything's okay if you have diabetes, but your blood sugars are controlled. Because what research has strongly shown is controlling blood sugars can prevent what we call the microvascular complications from diabetes, kidney damage, nerve damage, eye damage, blindness that can happen from diabetes. But what we call the macrovascular, the big arteries, the big vessels, it's not really improved by controlling blood sugars with those medicines. And so ultimately controlling those, you taking medicines to control your sugar, it's really not treating the cause of the diabetes, you're still diabetic. It might lower the risk of the, the microvascular complications, but heart attack risk and stroke risk is unchanged. Uh, and it was some of the medicines that actually could increase the risk to some degree. So uh, it, it's, it's really backwards. Uh, I, I, I give my patients a whole Dean Ornish analogy that we need to uh, shut off the faucet instead of just mopping the water off the floor. You may have heard that one, that all we do in the medical world is mop the water off the floor and we ignore the fact that the sink is on and overflowing. Just shut that sink off 
treat the cause of the problem. In a similar analogy for high blood pressure, people's blood pressure is high. We give them all these pills to lower it. They think things are fine. They continue their unhealthy lifestyle. Well, they still have a very high risk of heart attack, stroke, or other issues from their blood pressure, even though the numbers look okay on the medications. Because the second you stop the medicines, you miss one pill, whatever, the blood pressure shoots all back up again. So the better thing is treat the cause, eat healthy, lose the weight, and your risk will go down to not zero, but but much closer to zero than just taking the medicines alone. No question. Do people with heart disease, did they fare worse with COVID? Oh yeah, no question. And that was actually the big push that uh, through the help of uh, PCRM and some other places, a lot of the doctors in the lifestyle medicine world sent letters to, uh, to the politicians in their area saying, listen, I know you guys are telling people to wear masks, uh, socially distance, wash your hands. That's all fine and dandy, but you know what? This pandemic would be much of an issue if everybody was healthy. You know, and some, I forget the number now with the new data shows. I know the old data said 93% of deaths happen to people with a chronic disease. I'm assuming it's probably still similar with the newer data that's come out. So our focus needs to be on making sure we're healthy so that if you do get COVID, you don't die from it. And also to prepare us for the next pandemic, which of course, most likely is going to come from animal agriculture industry. So, you know, if we can just be healthy, shift away from that industry, keep, get all these chronic diseases, numbers to go way down, not only will we lessen our chance of another pandemic in the future, but if it does happen, we're, we're hopefully our bodies are prepared to tolerate it. So yeah, I just saw a cute t-shirt, vegetables, uh, no vegan, because vegetables never started a pandemic. Yeah, yes, that's very true. Yeah. Speaking of t-shirts, what does your t-shirt say, Jaden? Um, it says just a girl that loves pigs. Do you love pigs? Mm-hmm. Did you see the movie, Babe? Yeah. That's me. Do you have any pigs or pets? No. No, she she wants a pig. <laughs> I don't. And we want to like someday her. someday we want to rescue a pig, and because uh, pigs are smarter than dogs, right? Mm-hmm. And we watched Babe, and I and I heard the story that uh, the actor who played in Babe, the main I forget what his name is, he actually went vegan and became an animal rights activist because of his experience filming with the animals. Is that Richard Richard Richard, Richard Cromwell or? I, I think so. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. It's amazing. Nice. That's fantastic. Well, Dr. Dr. Loam, I'd love to have you come back for your own episode. Maybe we can do talk heart disease and show some slides or things like that because people love asking questions to doctors. Uh, I would like be that. happy. To, I, I would be honored to. You, you've been so influential in so many people's lives. Oh. To anything I can do to help. Absolutely. Thank you. Hey, Jaden, do you make any other cakes other than ones out of watermelon? Yeah, I make regular, like basically regular cakes, but I make them vegan with no ingredients like that. That's so cool. You know what she did once? Let me tell you the story. I had a patient when I was at Rush working with Kim Williams and uh, she came in with a small heart attack. She needed bypass surgery is the standard treatment. You know, of course, not changing your diet, reversing the disease, standard treatment, bypass surgery. So she's told she needs bypass surgery. She's overweight, diabetes. And it just turns out that her surgery is gonna be on her birthday. And I tell this story to uh, the kids, Jaden and, and her sister, Kaylin. I'm like, well, should we, should we do something for her? And they're like, let's make her a cake. Let's make her a cake. So we actually got this recipe. Um, I forget where we got it from. What is it made out of? Sweet, sweet potatoes, whole wheat, spelt flour. I know that icing is more of an avocado mm-hmm. icing. It uses some coconut sugar. So there's, there's you know, sugar that's in there. But um, it was no eggs. No, it was no oil. It was, you know, plant-based, no oil, which is a little bit of sugar. And I brought it in. And oh my gosh, there were some family members that were there. They were not only so appreciative that, uh, that Jaden made the cake, but it was gone like that. They ate it and they're like, that's one of the best cakes I've ever had. I'm like, yes, guess what? It's you know, 100% vegan, no oil, just a little bit of coconut sugar that's in there. And they just couldn't believe it. We used you know, dates and other things to sweeten it as well. Uh, but- Well, that's cool. Maybe good. Jaden will come back and make that cake on my channel. That sounds wonderful. Yeah, it's a great, it's a great recipe. Yeah. Maybe you'll open a bakery. You could call uh, Jaden's Vegan Creations or the Pink Pig Bakery. She did sell some uh, cupcakes mm-hmm. to some of the neighbors uh, as, as kind of a try to promote eating more plant-based to show people how, how great, you know, baking uh, vegan can be. So I'm very proud of her for that. Yeah. Jaden, how do you handle holidays like uh, Halloween? Um, usually <laughs> uh, when we go trick-or-treating, um, most of the candy isn't vegan, but sometimes there's like like gummies or Sour Patch Kids, like those are vegan. 
but a lot of the times you can only keep like three pieces and then the rest goes in a giant bucket that's like super high up. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a hard balance because, you know, the way our culture is, you do want to let kids be kids. And if it's, I, I battle with this a lot, if you 100% restrict every single little thing, then when they get on the world on their own, mm -hmm. it's really going to be a challenge for them to be able to manage that on their own when all their friends and peers and they're exposed to all these things. And so uh, we only let them have very small amounts, educating them about, hey, listen, this is the, the rare treat. Um, but, uh, and they, they've been very good with that. But it's, um, of course, at our house, nobody wants to come to our house because we just hand out HEPA slices, right? <laughs> oh, no. I hear you can donate candy to, I guess, troops or, or places. I'm not sure, sure. Where, but I've heard that. We've well, done that. We've done that before, yeah. That's so cool. Or you know what I hear some parents do is they, they let the kids go trick-or-treating for the experience and then they pay them money for the candy where they can buy stuff they really like, like yeah, seeds. There's even dentist offices that will that will take the candy because they don't want the kids to eat it for their dental health. Uh, I, I've seen I've seen that before, but yeah. That's very and, cool. And, and one of my sons, um, our uh, eight-year-old, his birthday is on Halloween. So we have an excuse where we could be like, hey, it's a birthday party. We're going to have a healthy birthday party and we're not going to, you know, be uh, out trick or treating too much. We got to hurry up, get back, so that we can celebrate your birthday. <laughs> nice. Well, you know, I, I've heard that some dentists actually hand out toothbrush toothbrushes for Halloween. Uh, do you hand out Lipitor to all the children? <laughs> no, no, I wouldn't do that. <laughs> <laughs> I was just kidding, of course. Yeah. It's, it's just been so fun getting to know you guys. And I'm guessing, do you have grandparents that are still alive, Jaden? Mm -hmm. Do they eat this way? And can you influence them by your health and beauty to do so? Uh, I think so. I think they are mostly vegan on um, my mom's side. And then my dad's side is completely vegan. I think. Yeah. Nice. What about cousins? Any cousins? Yeah. I don't think that they're vegan yet, though. One of them is almost. Um, yeah. Almost. But the other ones, unfortunately, haven't been as influenced. But, uh, you know, I always tell people, because I, I get that question a lot, well, what do you do about friends and family? They, you know, people get so passionate about the topic. They want to share the information, make their family and friends healthy. But, you know, there's a lot of times there's barriers to it and uh, you don't want to ever get somebody angry at you. You know, talking about food is sometimes like talking about politics or religion, you know? It's so harder actually lead, in a lot of ways. <laughs> it is. Yeah, so lead by example is what I always say. Yeah. Lead by example, you can introduce the topic gently, don't push it. And so that's what we did with some of our family members. Listen, if you're ever ready and you want, we're here to kind of talk it over and go through things. but um my mom and dad each lost more than 100 pounds reversed their diabetes that's incredible and, yeah yeah and, they should yeah. come on the show and tell their story <laughs> that's a wonderful I, story i uh, i got my mom the book how not to die uh and she's like oh that's so nice my son doesn't want me to die and she had no clue like what it was about <laughs> and then she reads it and it was like she she ran with it and uh and, it, and the rest is history and then yeah um my uh jaden here is half korean i don't know if you could tell uh, but her, her mom's Korean, uh, and so her grandparents had a traditional Korean diet, which is mostly a plant-based diet, it's small amounts of meat, there's really no dairy in a Korean diet, they use a lot of sesame oil though, and so they have done a, a good job of, of reducing the oil, and at least when we're around, I, I think they're almost 100% uh, meat-free, so, uh, and I know they cut the eggs out, so they're almost 100% there, and they've gotten healthier because of it too, and you know, it, when people learn the, the truth about it and how important it is, you, they, they change. We just need that extra push to, to get there. Yeah. You know, I'm looking at that cute t-shirt. I'm thinking I was raised Orthodox Jewish. And so, yes, we had some meat. I mean, we ate fit. My family had, I would never eat fish. I mean, even when I wasn't vegan, there was just something creepy and gross. I would never eat it. But there was meat at dinner. But I never could understand how anyone could eat a pig. Like, they, that just never made sense to me. Pigs are cute, yeah. right? Their pigs are cute, they're intelligent. And, uh, and you know, I know everybody always goes bacon, 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 but you know what? You can make bacon out of zucchini, out of shiitake mushrooms, you can tempeh bacon. There's, there's lots of other ways you can make bacon. And, uh, and the thing is people like bacon because of the sugar, fat, and salt, because if you didn't cure it and if you didn't put that on it, people wouldn't like it. Yeah, that's so funny. Cause when, when sometimes when like, when people are eating transition foods in a plant-based diet, they're eating like the Beyond Burgers and the Impossible Whoppers, which of course isn't as, as healthy for you they're processed, whatever, but they're okay to get people off of meat and transition until they get healthier. Uh, you hear people say, who are trying to bash vegans, they'll say, 
why is it that you need to make all of your vegan food look like meat? And the response is, well, why is it that you have to season all of your meat with plants in order to make it taste good? Because when you eat meat by itself with no plant-based seasonings on it, it doesn't taste good, right? And so it's the plants that makes it taste good. So of course, anything that is animal-based, just make it plant-based and you could make it taste good. So yeah. no, need, no need to hurt any pigs, right? Mm -hmm. Well, I think the reason they make the meat the plants taste like meat or look like meat is so that more people will eat the plants because yeah, I, when, yeah. I went, when I went vegan, none of that stuff existed. Yeah. Yeah. It's amazing how, how far things have come, which, you know, it's a step in the right direction for sure. Yeah. Well guys, thank you so much for what you do. Both of you. Wow. Uh, father daughters each have YouTube channels. Any competition there? Uh, no, 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 not at all. No, I'm, I'm so, I'm so proud of her. You know, she, again, she ran with it all on her own, all the editing, all the shooting. The only thing I did was try to keep the other five kids quiet so she can, so she can video without uh, any noise in the background. So, um, you know, hopefully uh, keep on uh, influencing things. And I know that um, you're not going to brag for you. I'm going to brag for her. She's had people, messengers say, Hey, I tried this recipe. This is great. You've inspired me. I'm eating way more plant-based now because of it. And, and uh, just like I, I tell my patients or when I'm giving lectures, even if you're not a doctor or in the healthcare field, it's spreading the truth about lifestyle medicine, eating plant-based, you can save people's lives. So I like to think that through Jaden's channel and activism that already at the young age of 14, she's starting to save people's lives, which is a good thing. I'm sure she is. Not just the pigs, but people too. <laughs> and inspire them. And then when, when your patients complain how hard it is to cook, you say, well, my 14-year-old daughter does. So here yeah. we have this channel. <laughs> Will any of the other five kids aspire to do YouTube, you think? You think? No one wants to. Yeah. He's doing, he wants to do, you know, how kids are. They want to do more funny type channels and, and, and do things like that. But um, yeah, I mean, the more, in, uh, the more people get out there and, and spread the message, the better it's going to be. So I'm sure that we're going to have more. And let's get you an Instant Pot, Jaden, and make you do Instant Pot cooking for kids. Yeah, yeah, that would be good. Yeah. Yeah, well, thank you guys. You guys have been delightful. And I'd love to have you back, Dr. Long, because people love all that sciencey stuff. You know, uh, I, I, was, I was interviewing an Indian doctor today and she said, medicine never cures. And, you know, in cardiology, they, they hand out statins like they're Skittles. Yep, yep. It, and it's because, again, uh, it, it might slightly lower the risk to some degree, but there's risk to the statins. And just getting people to change their diet, I don't know. They just think... If you take the medication, I can keep going with my unhealthy habits. It's just the wrong mindset. Yeah. Well, I think that Jane did such a great job today that she deserves a family pig pet. Yeah, I think so too. Yes, we should find one. We got to rescue. Because you know, you right? can definitely rescue them. You know, I mean, you, you can definitely rescue pigs. Yeah, I remember we, we're fans of Esther the Wonder Pig. Whew, yeah. and, and they're actually very easy to, to housebreak. Yeah. We're going to do it someday. <laughs> someday. <laughs> do, you, do you have a name picked out for your future? Uh, Pig sibling, porcine sibling. Um, I don't know. Maybe just piggy. <laughs> <laughs> piggy. <laughs> That's cute. I love I love pigs too. They're great. Well, thanks so much, uh, Dr. Loma. Thank you so much, Jane, for the wonderful presentation. Thank you for having us, Thank for sure. You. It is my pleasure. And thanks all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please come back tomorrow for another fabulous show. <laughs>